Today I'm speaking with Stephen Batchelor. Stephen is a Buddhist scholar and translator and meditation teacher. He's a former monk in both the Tibetan and Zen traditions. And he's best known for his secular or agnostic approach to Buddhism. I'll read from his bio now. Stephen considers Buddhism to be a constantly evolving culture of awakening, rather than a religious system based on immutable dogmas and beliefs. In particular, he regards the doctrines of karma and rebirth to be features of an ancient Indian civilization and not intrinsic to what the Buddha taught. Buddhism has survived for the past 2,500 years because of its capacity to reinvent itself. Through his writings, translations, and teaching, Stephen engages in a critical exploration of Buddhism's role in the modern world, which has earned him both condemnation as a heretic and praise as a reformer. Okay, so um, I really enjoyed this conversation. We talk about how practice is about more than meditation, how it requires an intellectual and ethical understanding of one's life in the world, and on Stephen's account, it's about living life in a complete and authentic way. We talk about the nature of the freedom that one can reasonably hope for, and about the illusions and abuses of power that one encounters in traditional meditation contexts. We get into areas of disagreement in the second half. Uh, there's one term I should define, I think it's defined somewhere in this course, but we use it early on and I just want to make sure there's no confusion. The term is Dharma, and this word, both in Buddhism and the Indian tradition, that's now largely identified with Hinduism, it can mean two things generally. It can mean the inherent nature of reality, the law, the truth. It can mean both individual aspects of reality or reality itself. And again, this is reality that's inseparable from the mind. So we're talking about the nature of mind, the nature of consciousness. But also it can refer to the teachings that allow for the realization of the nature of mind. And in this conversation, we use it in the second sense, generally, to refer to the Buddha's teachings. And now I bring you Stephen Batchelor. I am here with Stephen Batchelor. Stephen, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here, Sam. So it's been a long time. We met many years ago. I don't think I've seen you, though, for it's got to be 20 years or something. I think it's probably 20 years plus, yeah. I suspect. Yeah. Well, we have, um, we have many friends in common and have been in similar um, meditation circles. But uh, yeah, it's, it's taken too long to reconnect. And uh, we, I can't even see you now. You are in France and I am in the U.S. But um, the, um, the miracle of modern communication allows us to, to record this conversation, or at least we hope. We hope. First, I should say at the top that you know, you've written many fascinating books that people would do well to read. I'm thinking in particular of an early one, The Faith to Doubt and Buddhism Without Beliefs, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. And you have a new one, which I've only just started, which is I have in galley form, is coming out in 2020, The Art of Solitude. And as the titles of some of these books suggest, you, you've always been less in the religion business than many of our Buddhist friends who became teachers. And um, you've actually been openly skeptical of some of what is taught in most traditions of Buddhism. How would you identify yourself as a, as a teacher and, and practitioner at this point? Well, I find that somewhat of a work in progress. Clearly, I am indebted and rooted in the Buddhist tradition of which I've, I've spent my whole adult life doing nothing but study and practice and teach Buddhism and translate texts. So it's somewhat disingenuous to say that I'm not a Buddhist. Mm. But I'm not a Buddhist in the sense that I ascribe to any particular Buddhist orthodoxy. I don't ascribe to any of the orthodoxies that are well known in the different schools that we have inherited from Asia. I find myself somehow free floating through Buddhism. I have a somewhat love-hate relationship with it. Mm. There are elements of it I find very frustrating. I find it's very slow and sluggish in being able to really be intellectually critical of itself. And um, it also is a phenomenon now so 
complex that any one particular school will only ever catch a flavor of it, really. Mm. And my own experience, having gone through so many different traditions, is that I've imbibed something from all of them of value. And uh, of course, I, I don't accept certain Orthodox Buddhist beliefs, but I have a great uh, heartfelt commitment to what I understand by the Dharma. Yeah. Buddhism, I think, sometimes gets in the way of practicing the Dharma. Yeah, yeah. So you and I are very similar in that regard, although I've been, I've been more eclectic <laughs> than you and, and more openly confrontational of organized religion, I think. Mm -hmm. But let's start with your, your contemplative history. How, how did you get into meditation and what were some of the most important teachers for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I only, could, I only started formally practicing meditation when I arrived in Dharamsala, where the Dalai Lama had his capital in exile, in 1972. I was 19 years old. I was drawn to India for largely romantic reasons, mm -hmm. I think, but also a kind of a real, I think, genuine curiosity about the spirituality and the philosophy of uh, the East, of that which we did not know at that time, at least as much as we know now. How did you get pointed toward Dharamsala? It seemed like you already had a, a Buddhist inclination rather than a, a Hindu one. Uh, it's a good question, Sam. I wonder sometimes if I had stumbled into a Hindu ashram first, if I would not have stayed there. Mm. I think at the point at which I arrived at in India, I was sufficiently ill-informed to know much of any difference between these traditions. I was actually, like many of my generation, inspired by Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now, yeah. which I read shortly before I left for Asia. And that ha was much more Hindu than Buddhist in orientation. Yet he did speak of Goenka and uh, that sort of meditation, not the Tibetans, and I ended up with the Tibetans. Mm. I think largely I was fascinated by the the, the Dalai Lama, whatever, whoever that was. It was extraordinarily exotic to be in the Himalayas with these refugees who had effectively come from a, a medieval, fully functioning court in Lhasa, Tibet, and transplanted themselves to an Indian hill station in North India. It was an extraordinary moment to be able to encounter those, that culture completely unaffected by the West at that point, uh, with some really magnificent examples of humanity. Yeah. His Holiness Dalai Lama, of course, but also many of the other teachers there at that time. And they'd only been out for 12 years then. They all thought they would be going back right. relatively soon. But I was able from, as soon as I arrived in Dharamsala, to start practicing meditation with my Tibetan teachers, which was mainly reflective meditation, what they call Lam Rim just thinking through day by day reflectively on the same themes on topics like the value of human life, renunciation, the taking of refuge, and other sort of principal Buddhist themes, and, and the thinking about them in a quiet, slowed down way, mm -hmm. um, not just sort of reading and talking with one's friends, but but, but, but sit, sit, sitting cross-legged, calming the mind with the breath, maybe saying some mantras and some prayers, and then thinking about these things. And I found that very valuable. Right. So this is a, a practice that is not, when we talk about meditation generally, I mean, we, we, we tend to mean things that are, are far less conceptual than that and, and even entirely non-conceptual, or at least it's, it's often claimed. Whereas you're talking about kind of ethical and philosophical reflection that really creates a context for any further effort you would make in, in non-conceptual meditation. Exactly, yes. Of course, the non-conceptual meditation was in the background. It was all, and of course, that's what we wanted to do. Right. But the Tibetan uh, lamas of the Geluk school were very insistent that we, first of all, prepare ourselves by thinking through clearly what is the, basically the ethos and the logos of the Dharma by presenting it in this structured path to awakening called the Lam Rin. And at the same time, we did tantric sadhanas. We did visualizations of figures like Chenrezi, Avalokiteshvara, recited mantras, radiated mantra, lights and nectars and so on, and 
as sort of purification exercises, concentration exercises, exercises of active imagination, I suppose, mm. as well. Well, when you you just use the word tantra, and, and many people have an association with that term that it means sexual yoga. I, I picture this was <laughs> not, it was, it was not like Osho's version of tantra where you were um, having no, sex with anyone who had the temerity to get to the hill station with uh, beads and an ample supply of birth control. No. <laughs> um, no, this is absolutely the opposite of that. This is the Gelugpa, the most conservative, the most sort of morally upright of the Tibetan schools. And it's true, as a young monk, I was visualizing myself as a as a priapic, 36-armed, bull-headed deity and as a menstruating dakini. Mm. But no, there was no sexual practice. It was understood quite clearly as, 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 as symbolic spiritual exercises. Right. We knew that if you continued into the higher ranges of Tibetan Zogrim practice, then yes, there are exercises for channeling energies through which you can utilize sexual energy with a consort. But of course, at our, you know, the level we were there then as a young layman and monks, well, that wasn't really on the, on the menu. Right. So, so yeah, so take me from there. Well, then what did you, what did meditation become for you and, and who did you study with? Well, I did this training. Uh, I was a young, uh, I, I, for about two years, I did these reflective meditations. I studied a lot of Buddhist text and, uh, and theory and philosophy. I did these Vajrayana visualization exercises, mantras. And then after a couple of years, it was in the summer of 1974, for some reason, Goenka was invited to lead a 10 day Vipassana retreat at the institute where I was studying, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives mm -hmm. in Dharamsala. I, the Dalai Lama appears to have given this his blessing, if not in fact invited Goenka. And Western students who were at that institution, plus any Tibetan Buddhist monks, were invited to attend this 10 day course. And so I did that. And that changed everything. Suddenly, there was a practice that I could perform on my own body mind that didn't introduce reflections, didn't require imagining or visualizing anything, but introduced me in a direct and immediate way with the actuality of my own experience moment to moment. And uh, I'd experienced nothing like that whatsoever mm. in the meditations I'd done up until that point. And it had an impact that embedded itself or in my, my body, really, in a way that none of the Tibetan practices had. But at the same time, it was quite clear to me that this meditation made so much sense because I had a philosophical, ethical, Buddhist, conceptual frame and not just a conceptual frame, by that time, a commitment to living certain values. Mm. And that, the experience of vipassana, satipatthana, mindfulness, was is in effect the missing piece. And at that point, I would say that I really started practicing meditation, as I would teach it now, as a practice more to do with cultivation of concentration, of focus, embodiment, a certain quality of inquiry, but in many ways, a sensibility which one can deepen and refine through one's life that enables one hopefully to live better. Mm. So how do you view the connection between an intellectual understanding of the logic of practice and an ethical understanding and actual experience in meditation? How do, how do those strands how do they go together relate to you yeah well my zen teacher with whom i studied later that's another story we which we do need to cover i think yeah saw those three which are you know ethics contemplation or samadhi and uh discernment or wisdom as like three three pillars of a tripod in other words the practice what one calls one's practice is not reducible to any one of those three but is somehow what is held uh, within that frame. So by ethics, I don't mean adhering to certain precepts and doing what's allowed and not doing what's forbidden. 
but rather a conscious orientation to what your life is for, mm. what you value most deeply, your sense of the good, a sense of, 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 of practices that can somehow help lead you in a life in which you are able to realize those values. Meditation is one such tool. And the intellect, understanding, reflection, insight is another, is another tool. But all of them are held within this triad, as it were, that constitutes the whole. And it's there, I think, we can talk about practice in the broader sense. I feel that often when you ask a Buddhist, what is your practice? They usually will list a particular spiritual exercise, Vipassana or Dzogchen or something. But I think that does practice a disservice. Practice seems to me the practice of really being human, the practice of living life in a complete and authentic way. And that has to imply for me an ethical orientation. Mm. In other words, you're able to answer the question, why do you do this? Who are you doing it for? And at the same time, there is a critical and I think quite rigorous intellectual tradition that supports this through philosophy and a contemplative tradition that grounds these ideas and values in a much more embodied way that holds them at the center of a, of a more integrated life, at least mm. ideally. I don't pretend, by the way, to live up to these things moment to moment. But that's well, yeah, the vision yeah. that I think. Well, I want to get to that as well. But yeah, I think, I think of this more and more in, in terms of the Greek phrase, living an examined life, and just what that, what, yes, what exactly. that entails. Mm. And clearly there's a, there's a contemplative, non-conceptual dimension to that, which we'll talk about. But there's just this lar larger picture of understanding how one's intentions and one's relationships and, and engagement with the world and, and true motives as opposed to professed motives, all of this is part of the minds and therefore lives we are building. I mean, you can, you can sort of see your mind externalized in your life in all kinds of ways, in your relationships and the things that capture your attention, in the goals to which you strive. And your powers of self-awareness or awareness itself cultivated in meditation practice become the tool by which you would you'll, you'll actually increasingly notice what's going on and and why you're doing certain things and the effects of various experiences and just how how good is it to get the thing you wanted and how bad is it to not get it and all of that no that's right and um i like you go back very much to the greeks and and uh, in fact that's something that it becoming more and more of interest to me. But yes, it is about an examined life, as Socrates would have understood that. Yeah. A conscious life, a reflective life, a self-critical life. Another Greek term that I find is very useful here is, is eudaimonia, yeah. which is now often translated by scholars as uh, human flourishing. Right. And, and that too, I think, captures very well the vision of the Dharma, uh, not as you know, striving for some enlightenment, but rather to actually find ways to live in which we, we come into our own, we find our own voice, we become independent of others, as the Buddha often advised, and um, uh, we become who we can become. And I feel there's a great uh, potential by recovering some of these early Greek philosophies, particularly the Hellenistic philosophies, is that they too saw themselves as practices, not as abstract theories apart sort of commenting on life but things to do things to actually make a difference in your inner life the curing of the soul yeah is the phrase they would have used and i think there's a great a commonality in the roots of some of these asian traditions particularly buddhism with the uh, hellenistic philosophies of our own culture yeah i mean i think there's even some speculation that there was a cross-pollination from India to Greece. I mean, so some of the skeptical philosophers had had some contact with Indian yogis, and Greek skepticism in particular, and I guess uh, mm -hmm. Stoicism as well, has, has so much of the, the wisdom of 
the East without apparently much of the methodology. But I mean, you know, Greek, Greek skepticism, as far as I understand it, you know, that came through Pyrrho, mm -hmm. it seems to me just like a, it's it's very Nagarjuna like in kind of suspending <laughs> one's conceptual attachment and reification of experience. No, that's absolutely right. And uh, Pyrrho, of course, traveled to India with Alexander the Great right. as part of his uh, civilizing army, as they saw it. And he's said to have studied with the gymnosophists, the naked sages exactly. of India, the, the sages of Persia. And the Greek records also report that uh, Democritus, who was the first philosopher to posit an entirely materialistic view of the world, of atoms and void, also traveled to India and studied with gymnosophists a generation before Pyrrho. Mm. Pyrrho was, in fact, in the line of, of Democritian thought. But you're right, it's the, it's the skepticism. And my sense is that, at least on the reading of certain key passages in the Pali texts, the Buddha too comes across very strongly as a skeptic. The closest text, I think, to Pyrrho, or the fragments of Pyrrho that have come down to us, are found in the Atakavaga, the chapter of eights, which is in the Sutta Nipata, where you find um, verses and ideas very, very similar to that of the Greek skeptics, mm. the early Greek skeptics. But you're right also in that we don't have from the Greek tradition such a strong heritage of praxis, of exercises, of something to do. Yeah. There are very strong hints in the records that the Stoics, and one thinks of Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, mm -hmm. were doing something very similar to the kind of lam rim meditations I was doing with the Tibetans. Thought training, as the Tibetans call it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you get that with the Stoics a lot, just the power of certain reflections mm -hmm. to uh, you know, kind of inoculate the mind against emotional reactions that are not productive. There's been a renaissance of interest in Stoicism of late. That's right. Okay, so you are now a, we're in, we're around 1974, <laughs> and you are, you're, you're actually an enrobed Galupa monk at this point, right? A Tibetan monk. Exactly. In fact, I did the, I did the Goenka retreat two months after I'd been ordained as a novice mm -hmm. within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So yeah, it was also an experience that impacted greatly on my sense of being a monk. And so how, how long did you stay in robes? in the Tibetan tradition? In the Tibetan tradition, another six years, and then the Zen tradition, four years. So a total of 10 years throughout my 20s. But given the effect that the Goenka retreat had on you, how come you didn't just make a, a beeline for the Theravada beeline. at that point? Well, I thought of it. It was a conflict. I had great faith in my Tibetan teachers. I respected them enormously. I'd learned a huge amount from them, not just in terms of you know, theoretical knowledge, but I, I honored them as great examples of, of, of human beings. And I was committed to my studies and my uh, training under their guidance. Mm. And I had no, you know, there was part of me that was still very much involved in pursuing that path. I was also in the middle of, tran of, of a project to translate uh, Shanti Deva's Bodhichari Avatar, a, a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life mm -hmm. that I was studying in Japan, a project that was overseen by the Dalai Lama. And I didn't want to interrupt that either. But at the same time, my eyes had been opened to a form of meditative practice that I wasn't finding with my Tibetan teachers at all. And I also, shortly after that, met Christina Feldman and Christopher Titmus, who came through Dharamsala, having been in Thailand and elsewhere. And from them, I learned a great deal about Theravada Buddhism for the first time. And there were moments when I seriously thought that it would make more sense for me to go to study with the community of, of Ajahn Chah. Right. But at the end of the day, I felt that my priorities lay where I was committed as a monk in training as a student. And an engagement still very much with ideas that I was very, very involved in. But it was, there were moments of doubt. And at that point, in a sense, I guess the seeds were sown of my subsequent departures from tradition because it was impossible for me then to 
consider that one Buddhist tradition somehow had all the goods. Mm. All of the, I, I had my feet already now in two traditions. I continued my vipassana practice from then on. I never get, I know, ne- I never stopped having that as the basis of my meditations. Even though I continued with my Vajrayana sadhanas as well, mm. but in an experiential embodied sense, my meditation was then from that point on really mindfulness of body feelings, mind states. That was central for my practice. Okay, so then what happened? <laughs> then what happened? <laughs> oh, it's a long story, and you can read about it. I uh, hear Zen is in your future. But if we just, uh, yes, well, you see, that's the um, that's the next step. After a number of years, without going into any detail, I found I could no longer, in good faith, remain within the context of a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. I simply could not believe what most of them believed. And I also had no aptitude for the tantric Vajrayana practices that were, were considered to be you know, the epitome of contemplative training. And likewise, uh, Mahamudra and things did not appeal to me enormously either. Mm. I'd always, and so I got to a point where I really couldn't continue with this anymore. What about Zogchen? Did you did you not stumble into uh, Dingo Kensi's orbit, or again here by hangs quite a long story for the Gelugpas? Zogchen is essentially a heresy. Yeah, and it's never taught uh, in any Gelugpa monastery, and no, uh, the Gelugpa have a, a, a very very um, they're not keen on it at all. And they would never teach it. And in fact, it has been the source of a lot of sectarian conflict within right. Tibet over the status. Except of the there was that. Well, I don't want to. Except there was that episode of the Dalai Lama taking teachings from Kensi Rinpoche and I think uh, Nyosho Ken Rinpoche. Yeah, that that was what triggered the whole problem. Oh, oh really? Um, I was in Dharamsala <laughs> when. Sorry, uh, I, I, I was I with Dharam. I was yeah. in. Dharamsala. Sorry, we're, get, Sorry we're, we're, yeah, we're getting some latency here, so. So yet I, I didn't realize oh. that was the source of controversy. I thought I thought that mollified many people who thought there was a unbridgeable gulf between the, the two teachings. <laughs> How long have we got? <laughs> now, this, this is a fascinating story, and I witnessed it from the inside. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. Um, <laughs> but um, the Dalai Lama himself. Let's just try and put this brief. I don't want to get drawn into this. Story. Sure, it's not really relevant. The, the Dalai Lama had a responsibility as the head of the Tibetan community in exile to ensure harmony amongst his somewhat fractious communities of Tibetans from all different parts of Tibet, from different religious traditions, many of whom didn't know much about each other. It's a large country with lots of regional centers of power. And one of the big conflicts uh, lay within the antipathies between the Gelukpas and the Rimeba. In other words, a 19th century reform movement started by the Kenzi Rinpoches and uh, the Kongdrut Mm. uh, that more or less became a a sort of a a syncretic body in which most Nyingma and Kagyu teachers were aligned. And they stood as a kind of counterforce in Tibet to the hegemony of the Gelugpa church. It was also regionally divided, the Rime were largely in the east of Tibet, the Dalai Lama and the others in, in central Tibet. And so th- when they came into exile, they brought these long-standing historical conflicts with them, and there were many others as well between the Gelupas and the Kargupas and the Karmapa and the Dalai Lama, and all these things. And the Dalai Lama, I think in very good faith, wanted to heal some of these divisions. And uh, I think with personal interest, as well as a larger agenda, he took teachings from Dilgo Kenzi Rinpoche in the mid-1970s on Dzogchen. And this was quite public. I remember seeing Dilgo Kenzi Rinpoche in Dharamsara at that time. But that created awful repercussions within mm. the Gelugpa church. It was felt to be a step too far by some Tibetans. The, this was a, not a, a conciliating move, but a move that was actually opening up a split within the Dalai Lama's own tradition, mm, within the Gelugpa. So it's a complicated story. It's a complicated story. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, the details of, of sectarianism and the politics of 
theocracy uh, are are always interesting and, and fairly depressing when you get into the details. But I, I do want to talk to you about some controversies with just teachers in general and whether mm-hmm. whether the guru disciple principle is is broken on some level. But um, we'll get there. So just give me a little bit more of your background. How did you? Was your next move to get to uh, Korean Zen, or is there a stop between? Well, there. it depends on how much, how much granularity okay. you want. If we just stick to the meditation story, I got to a point where I felt I had little choice but to uh, leave my Tibetan training. I still was committed very much to be a Buddhist monk. I basically had two options at that point. Once again, I could have gone to Thailand or Burma or Sri Lanka to deepen my Vipassana practice, but I didn't. I don't know why. I've often asked myself, why not? I think Zen attracted me because it always had attracted me. The very first book I read about Buddhism when I was about 17 was The Spirit of Zen by Alan Watts. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've been dipping into Zen or meeting people who'd done Zen practice. And there was something in me that responded very viscerally to its aesthetic for a start, its pithiness, its love of paradox and. the koans and the artwork, this appealed to me enormously in a completely non-conceptual way. I was just drawn to that. And a friend of mine, Charles Genou. Yeah, I know Charles. To make his living by leading tour groups in East Asia while he was studying Tibetan Buddhism in Switzerland with us. And he discovered this monastery in Korea where they observed the Vinaya. In other words, they accepted you as a fully ordained monk, whereas in Japan, I would have just been a lay person, really. And they offered a much more intensive meditation training. We had three months, nine, nine, 90 days meditation in the summer, 90 days in the winter on a continuous rotation. So I uh, wrote to the monastery there and asked to join the community and uh, went there in 1980, I think it was. And I spent four years there doing three months on, three months off, three months on, three months off for, I suppose it was yeah, nearly four years in total. And uh, that was a practice that um, was completely different to anything I'd done in the, in the Tibetan tradition and likewise in the, my Vipassana practice too. And this was really a... Was it a koan-based practice or were you doing uh, just sitting as well? No, it was it was it's a Rinzai Zen tradition in uh, Korea. There is no Soto Zen, mm. and but it goes back more to not to it's Rinzai or Imje going back really to Chinese Buddhism rather than Japanese. And the practice was a koan practice, but in Korea you don't pass koans in the way you do in Japan mm. and go through different sequences of koans. You stay with, you just have one question, and that question is, what is this? And you just stay with that question. You, you seek to embody that question in your bones and in your flesh, and you ask it to the point where you cease to have any expectation, hope, or interest in ever having an answer. It's pure skepsis. Yeah. Skeptic, skeptic skepsis, inquiry, analysis, investigation, examination. And it is allowing yourself to embody what they call the great doubt. Which really is, if, if there was any method to Greek skepticism, it really does seem to be this kind of bracketing of any experience with this doubt. And what is this? Is a good enough way of provoking it? That's true. And um, I, I suspect the, the Pyrrhonists, and maybe some of the later academic skeptics too, would have used exercises perhaps a bit like this. Or simply, you see, I think, we, I think sometimes we get a little precious about wanting to frame things as you know, formal exercises in, in meditation. This, these were men and women, mainly men, I guess, who were just taken over with these questions. They couldn't not ask them. At least that would have been, I think, the ideal, and mm. to have pursued that relentlessly. It's true in the Greek tradition, you don't have the sense of valuing quiet, and silence and long periods of, of just immobility, as it were. You find a couple of passages which describe Socrates in that kind of sort of samadhi state. 
and also Democritus. You know, some of the descriptions of Democritus have him going into a room and contemplating things in silence. But it's true that what really speaks to many of us, I think, from Buddhism and other Asian traditions is this very rich uh, legacy of formal contemplative practice. Uh, and that is, I think the philosophies over inter interfuse very well. Do you know the book, Tra uh, this is now the translation, Tracing Back the Radiance by uh, Chinul? Well, yes, you see Chinul, yeah, Tracing Back the Radiance by Chinul, translated by Robert Buswell. Chinul was the founder of the monastery in which I stayed at oh, in Korea, Songwang Sao. So we, we basically trained in the methodology of Chinul. And we studied Chinook. Right. So I remember that being a, a really fascinating dissection of the the apparent opposition between sudden and gradual realization mm -hmm. of the truth of emptiness, or however you want to describe the the punchline. How did you? Mm -hmm. How how have you grappled with the with that apparent paradox in your practice? And what was where have you come out around it? Well, in the, in the Korean tradition to which uh, you're referring th with uh, Chinul, they have uh, Ch Chinul's position on sudden and gradual was that sudden practice is to be followed by gradual cultivation. Yeah. That's his resolution. Which is really. Of the sudden. Which really does dichotomy. seem to be a. It really seems to be a clear statement of the Dzogchen approach as well. Uh, yeah, I think it, I think it, it's, it goes further than that. To me, that idea is actually embedded in the in the four tasks, which is the way that I understand the four noble truths. That mm. that, that practice is it's not an either or things. It's not just it, what the sudden gradual distinction is trying to get to terms with is how do we integrate moments of insight, which sometimes have an almost timeless quality to them. You touch something transcendent, if you wish. How does that then interface and interconnect with our lives in the world, both as thinking and creatures, as social animals, and so forth and so on? And Chinul's understanding, and I think you'll find the same in, in, in other, it, certainly in the Tibetan traditions, but I think it goes right back to the early suttas, is that moments of insight, in order to be, as it were, realized or made real, need to be embodied in uh, thoughts and words and acts and work and so on. And this follows very simply from the experience of, of stopping, the experience of nibbana, the experience of where you're no longer under the grip of your reactive patterns, those moments when you uh, witness that inner freedom and openness, that is the opening of a, of a way, of a path. It's the letting go of certain things that are holding you back. And that leads to a kind of spontaneity of imagination that uh, is actualized through words and deeds and all of your interactions socially. And in early Buddhism, that's simply the Eightfold Path is unfolding at that point. But really, it's a kind of feedback loop. It's not just a one-off thing, a sudden insight. Life is constantly punctuated by moments of, of understanding or maybe confusion or a new perspective on things that then calls to be assimilated and to integrate it into how you live in the world. So it's a constant sort of interplay between the two. And I think all that Chino is saying, he's just, he's affirming really that these insights do not stand apart from the fabric of life itself. And nor are they, in some sense, reducible to the fabric of life. There's something sublime, something uh, intangible and ineffable about such moments. But the real challenge of practice is to somehow integrate and bring together these two conceptually distinct dimensions of our of our lives mm. yeah yeah i mean the, the crucial distinction for me i mean the, the reason why zogchen was such a an upgrade of my mindfulness practice essentially is that mm -hmm. when i was practicing purely in the in the burmese tradition i had a very goal-oriented dualistic and you know, kind of seeking sort of logic to my practice whereas it you know i had 
many experiences that tasted of freedom, but they were transitory and they were based on having spent a lot of time on the cushion, you know, mostly on retreat. And my practice, no matter how pleasant it became, did have this quality of a vigil where I was just waiting for a breakthrough, you know, wa waiting for something to be attained, waiting for something to no longer arise, and, and you know, waiting for the evidence of my unenlightenment to, to disappear. <laughs> and, you know, Dzogchen became a very different type of practice where I, I, could, I could then be mindful of the fact that in that moment there was no evidence of unenlightenment. You know, the, the way I put it, you know, when speaking to, you know, someone like our, our mutual friend, Joseph Goldstein, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's just you know, direct mindfulness of anatta or the illusoriness of the self, not as a strategy, but as the actual enjoyment in that moment of the, the truth of the, you know, the prior condition of consciousness. But, you know, then the, the, the gradual cultivation of that is then the practice, right? So that, that's why the paradox resolves itself, because yes, it's, it's true that there's actually nothing to attain, there's nothing to seek, there is no goal except for the what can be recognized in this moment, and, and you simply need to do that again, or, or cease to do the thing that is causing you to, to overlook it. Yes, I think that states very well, in fact, the, this whole idea of, um, of this uh, sudden gradual problem mm. but in some ways i don't know yeah. what's your what's your doubt there and I, this leads me to what i want to ask you now is what is your view of the nature of the the freedom on offer by any one of these paths and and how do you think of the concept of self-transcendence in that light well for me freedom has to be understood as a two-way street in a way it's a a moment of freedom is a freedom from something, but it's also a freedom to something. This is a distinction you find with Isaiah Berlin that I found very helpful. It's not just that some, you're freed from something, but in being freed from, say, let's say, attachment or anger or self-centeredness, that clears a space in which other possibilities are then made available. And uh, that is then opening up a freedom to act in a way that is not conditioned by your anger or your self-centeredness and so on. It's from that empty space that the path unfolds in terms of your thought and your words and your deeds and your interactions and so forth. And um, to me, this is really lies at the very heart of what this practice is about. It's about refining and opening up that inner spaciousness, that absence of reactivity, that non-reactive awareness that, of course, Dzogchen speaks of, of Rigpa, which is something very, very similar, I feel. That is, the, in a sense, the ground from which one then seeks to live moment to moment. Mm. It's not somewhere you, you rest and, and sort of are apart from your interactions with the world, it is an ethical space. Nibbana, for me, is simply the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion, the unconditioned. So you find mentioned in the early Buddhist texts, is likewise not described as a, as a state, as some kind of transcendent state, but it's understood as the absence of greed and hatred and delusion. That's the classical definition. And that suggests very much that unconditioned means not unconditioned in some absolute sense, but unconditioned by greed, unconditioned by hatred, unconditioned by egoism. That is a state of ethical possibility. In other words, I can learn to live my life as best I can with full awareness of my shortcomings in a way that's not so driven by my personal likes and dislikes, not so driven by my fears and my uh, wants, but tries to respond to the world from a non-reactive open mind. And I think that non-reactive open mind is also the ataraxia of the Greeks, mm -hmm. you know, the untroubled that Pyrrho sought to attain. In the longest fragment of Pyrrho, the founder of skepticism, uh, he talks of a practice in which you no longer think of things as is or is not, 
or both is and is not, or neither is or is not, the quadrilemma of the suttas and Nagarjuna. Mm -hmm. And if you can if you can empty your mind of that in that way, you come to what he calls aphatos, which is speechlessness or thoughtlessness. And that then leads you to ataraxia, which is untroubledness. And it's from that untroubled space that you then seek to live your life. Mm. I think the Chinese idea of wu wei, of, of, of inaction, is similar. The Buddhist nirvana, the unconditioned, rigpa, all of them, I think, are different ways of accessing this space of freedom. But it has to be a freedom from and a freedom to. Otherwise, I feel the freedom becomes too, as it were, identified with some kind of inner spiritual transcendence and loses sight of the fact that it also uh, has to do with moral freedom as well, a freedom not to get caught up and entangled in your, you know, your fan fantasies and biases and opinions and so on. Mm. Yeah, so I share with you this sense that there is a connection, a kind of an intrinsic connection between insight into the, the properties of the mind that we're talking about, you know, selflessness, the potential non-reactivity of, of conscious awareness, and ethics, and kind of purifying one's intentions with respect to actions in the world. But if there is a, such a connection, it seems you know, more tenuous than we would want it to be, given the fact that there are so many examples on offer of indisputably accomplished meditators behaving badly, right? We have all these gurus who fall from grace <sighs> spectacularly. And um, I mean, there's been, there's been no shortage in the Tibetan tradition or in the Zen. There's probably fewer, certainly fewer I can think of in the, in the Theravada tradition. But, you know, the Hindus offer endless example. I, re I recently interviewed Andrew Cohn, who I know you're aware of, and, you know, he mm -hmm. had his own adventures in this regard. What do you think of this really all too reliable misuse of power that we witness on the part of, again, most, I mean, or perhaps not all, but certainly most, let's, uh, let's put it at many of these people, can't merely be frauds. I mean, these are people who have genuine meditative attainments and talents, and they've experienced, you know, all of the, the, the states of consciousness you and I are alluding to. And in most cases, they, they become teachers and maintain their, their cults because they're actually capable of inducing these experiences in others. And yet the horror stories are, in certain cases, truly horrible. How do you think about this, this apparent contradiction? Well, there's many different ways that we can approach this. And um, one way I would like to approach it, more or less just off the top of my head, is to think of it really as a function of a certain kind of human institution. I think the, the, the institutions, let me just restrict myself to Buddhism, the institutions in which you find, in a way, the greatest number of incidents of this is in the institutions that are the most feudal and hierarchical in structure. Uh, you said yourself you have you know, more in the Zen and the Tibetan and less in the Theravada. Well, the kinds of societies that those three particular traditions come from rather make my point. If you have a, a society that honors a kind of absolute relation of power between a feudal lord and their underlings or a king and their subjects, and you model your monastic institutions probably quite self-unconsciously, on that structure of power, then you give people, uh, individ individual men, almost entirely, mm. extraordinary power over others. And when you have a theocratic tradition like in Tibet with notions of enlightenment that are frankly superhuman, and these are projected onto these men who have all this power, you have a very, very imbalanced relationship between the teacher and the student. So to me, I think you these, I'm not trying to explain this away as saying, well, it's because of the institutions, the individuals have no responsibility. Of course, the individuals have responsibility for their acts and 
But uh, I cannot fail to see that part of the problem lies in the structures of power mm. in which people operate. And Roman Catholic Church might strike you as slightly similar yeah. in its organization uh, with its the theology. You see, any claim to absolute truth, which many Tibetan and other uh, Zen Buddhists will claim, is a claim to absolute power. To me, the split into the relative truth and the ultimate truth, which is so widespread in Buddhism, also is a doctrine that under, underpins and legitimizes a, a particular structure of power. The, the Lama or the Roshi or the monk who has gained insight, in you, as you say, in, through these uh, deep spiritual in traditions and so forth, that person has accessed God effectively and thereby carries the authority and the power in the eyes of their followers to God himself. I don't think that's a situation in which, I find that to be a situation where almost invariably abuses of power are going to take place. So my reading of the early Buddhist tradition, and this is going back to the Pali Suttas, it's got nothing to do with institutional Theravada Buddhism, mm. is that the Buddha had no time whatsoever for the guru-disciple relationship. When he uses the word guru, and he could have done, the word was already in existence in the Upanishads at his time. He uses the word guru uh, very, very sparingly and always in a negative sense. Hmm. I didn't know that, actually. So, so he, he's actually disparaging other teachers with that term? He's basically not utilizing the common Indian word guru at all, hmm. uh, whereas it was a word current at his time, particularly in the, in the Upanishadic tradition. Yeah, yeah. In the Kalama Sutra, for example, uh, he says one of the reasons you shouldn't follow a teacher, or you, one, 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 one of the reasons not to believe something is because my guru told me. <laughs> right. Because my guru said That's a reason to treat that with caution. He never spoke of himself as a guru. He never spoke of his students in becoming gurus. They were friends. They were good friends. Uh, and they had a much more harmonious well, not, I don't know about harmonious, but a much a relationship of equality. Except when he, for his coming out and at various moments when he was asserting his spiritual authority, he, he had a fairly tyrannical way of announcing his bona fides. I mean, he said, you know, do not call me friend. I am the Tathagata. <laughs> so. Well, I, I think one has to look at these texts. This, I don't want to get into, into textual criticism and stuff, but those kinds of statements to me are clearly designed in retrospect to ramp up the authority of the figure called Gautama. Mm. One has to be very careful in, in, in reading these, these suttas. A lot of it is, is polemic and proper propaganda. It's true. Clearly, Gautama was a man of enormous authority. It would be silly to think otherwise. He would not have attracted such a following, would not have driven people to memorize all of this stuff created a community, worked with the, the most powerful people of his time if he were not an extraordinarily charismatic and authoritative figure. But he, he and also the followers too kind of see that as a one-off. Mm. And what he's to be remembered for, as he himself says on many occasions shortly before he dies, is that when I'm gone, do not think you will have no teacher. You will have a teacher. The Dhamma is your teacher. This is very clearly stated many, many times. And I think it's a very, very beautiful idea. In other words, to, instead of deferring to the authority of another person, the Buddha saw his legacy as having established a community, a Sangha, which was governed by the impersonal law, which is what the word Dharma means, of his teaching. Uh, he said quite explicitly, I do not, I will not appoint a successor. Mm -hmm. I have no intention to appoint a successor the Dharma will be your teacher. I would like to return to the spirit of those early ideas and take out you know, hierarchies of human power, often predicated on priesthoods, on claims to some kind of mystical enlightenment. And again, you know, one says, you know, these great teachers indisputably have. I don't know that. I would not say that. I really don't know. I'm not willing to simply defer to some mystical authority of another person without really getting to know that person. I've lived in 
monasteries with Tibetans and with Koreans. And I've got to know these uh, men. Uh, they're wonderful people, but they're also human beings like everybody else. They have all kinds of agendas going on like we do. They have all kinds of foibles and weaknesses as we do. Another way I would look at these scandals is also as uh, somehow bearing witness to the tragedy of being human, the tragedy of being put into a situation where you're more or less deprived of intimacy. As a young tulku, for example, mm -hmm. a young boy taken from his mother, raised up in a male environment, probably fairly brutally, and then uh, you know, deprived of any kind of, of caring female contact. Uh, and then given this enormous power. It's not a system I really feel um, is terribly healthy. And um, so I think these uh, warning signals we get from these, these uh, scandals uh, and so forth, uh, I think should lead us both to be concerned, not, you know, obviously for those who've suffered at their hands, but also to realize that there's an institution at work in which people struggle suffer and do their best and fail. But in my own approach, uh, as you probably are aware, I'm, I'm very interested in trying to recover what, what seems to be distinctive in the Buddhist teaching. And when we look at the organization of his community, we find a very different picture to the model that is on display in most Buddhist centers today. Mm. So that would be my response. Yeah, well, I, I really agree with all of that. And just personally speaking, it's, it's, you know, I've seen it from both sides. I've seen, you know, I've been in, in various spiritual communities to, to study with, with various meditation teachers, and you know, some of them struck me as truly great, and I, I saw no problem with them, but I, I also did not see the, the logic of assuming they were perfect. It was quite obvious that whatever their attainments in, in meditation were, there's nothing about becoming, you know, even completely stable and, and, and free of the, the, the usual illusions that one overcomes in, in practice. There's nothing about that that gives you other kinds of knowledge, right? It's not like these people became accomplished scientists or even philosophers on mm -hmm. the basis of their practice, much less political people that you would want to trust with the, the maintenance of civilization. There's clearly more to accomplish by way of becoming a, a fully actualized human being than merely having a, a direct insight into emptiness when everyone chooses. So the, the, the dogma around viewing the, the teacher as perfect never really landed in, in any, I think, in the intended sense, which is a, a superstitious mm -hmm. belief in in you know the it's, it's explicit in in the teaching that you know many of these people are assumed to have you know magic powers and certainly something like omniscience if they're to be Buddhas. Let's just take an inventory of of our skepticism here. I mean, what what in the the usual you know list of canonical beliefs do you reject or at least just bracket as something to which you you can't commit? Well, I think, I said earlier that I feel that the Buddha was basically a skeptic. I also think the Buddha was basically an ethicist. I don't think he was actually interested in questions as to what is the nature of reality. He never used the word truth, or certainly he never used the word ultimate truth to describe the, you know, his, his awakening at all. I don't think he was in the business of somehow gaining a mystical insight into some transcendent dimension of reality, whether you call it God or consciousness or whatever. He was interested not in what things are or are not, but he was interested in how, in, in what we do. How do, how, how do you live? That's what his concern was. And I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's about, it's not about, the, the teaching is not founded on the nature of what is being or non-being. It's founded on dukkha. It's founded on an engagement with the suffering of life. In that sense, its starting point is primarily empathetic and responsive. How do we build a fully human life in such a way that we can respond most appropriately to the suffering of the world? These are ethical questions. And that, I feel, is where 
Gorton the Late his his emphasis. But they're not they're not merely ethical in the sense of being interpersonal or or social. They're I mean he he had a I think an undeniably soteriological lens upon which he looked at the, this question of suffering, which is what does it mean to uproot suffering directly? I mean that's that's not a, a an interpersonal injunction he's pointing to it it really is about discovering something about the nature of one's own mind and the mechanics of one's own suffering moment to moment well this is where i've kind of departed perhaps and now going back to your earlier question actually this is perhaps a good point to bring this in i've departed entirely from the language of the four noble truths oh, interesting and that includes the whole idea about uh, suffering and the ending of suffering and the craving and ignorance being the cause of suffering i think that's all basically dogma so now why, and why um, so, so it'll be, be fascinating to get you in a room with Joseph Goldstein and see how this plays out. But and no doubt you've done this with Joseph before. But so, so what, why were you tempted to do that before you tell me where you've landed? What, what, what's the... <laughs> tempted is not really the word. Um, this, what, what satanic uh, my... influence has intruded upon your mind? Satanic? How did Mara get in on right. the act? <laughs> well... You see, Sam, I think of myself in many ways as a theologian, which sounds very strange mm. since I don't believe in God. But over the years, I've been very influenced by the writings of certain Christian theologians, not so much in what they have to say about Christianity, which I often doesn't really make much sense to me, but in their methodologies, in their way in which they critically analyze texts, in the way in which they seek to take these old religious ideas and somehow give them new life, to find another language for them, the language of modern philosophy, psychology, or whatever. And that was also, although rather differently, the impetus I was given by my Tibetan teachers when I was 19 years old. They would always say, you know, don't just believe this stuff, analyze it. Analyze it, and this is something the Tibetans say all the time, like a goldsmith would examine gold. You scrape it and you burn it and you do all these tests. And only when you've done that do you say, okay, it's gold. It's the real thing. Now, I was trained by my Tibetan teachers to look at their teachings critically. And they provided a, a range of tools, including lengthy study of logic, uh, epistemology, dialectics, all in Tibetan, uh, which gave us a kind of critical apparatus with which to, you know, start taking some of these ideas apart. Coupled with my own Western education, I never went to college or anything, but, you know, I was a bright kid and I was taken with philosophical ideas from a young age, that when I, start, when I started studying the Dharma, I really wanted to understand what it was all about. And I took these teachings very seriously. But I also took them critically, and we were debating these things. Unlike Tibetans, I was also exposing myself to other forms of Buddhist teaching, as I've mentioned. I was also starting to read more widely in Western philosophy. And all of this served as a kind of driving force to pursue this question of what was the Buddha really trying to say? What was this? Where did this? What's, all, what's this all about? Mm. This Dharma paths and enlightenment, all this stuff. What's it all about? And um, I take these things very seriously. I spend much of my time thinking about this stuff. And so my temptation, as it were, to rethink the Four Noble Truths in this sort of different way goes right back to the beginnings. I've always been utterly fascinated by the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. I've also, from the very outset, found it very odd as a doctrine. I found the sequencing very strange, suffering its origins, nirvana, and then the way to nirvana. It's a strange structure. And I've explored this in many ways, going back to early Pali texts, but also, as I'm beginning to realize more and more, funnily enough, is that many of the key, the core, the, the, the seed ideas were already planted by my Tibetan training. We don't have the time to go into this in any great detail, but the point is that these, uh, th this reading of the Four Noble Truths as the Four Tasks is something that is the culmination of, of, of my life's work, really. But once you do that, once you, instead of thinking of Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths provides a very, very clear sort of 
logical operating system of the whole Buddhist edifice. Mm. You have suffering, its cause, what are its cause, identify its causes, and then you'll get rid of suffering through the practice of the path that leads you to nirvana. I think that's all wrong, frankly. I think that's just Buddhist dogma that has grown up upon what probably started life as a set of four injunctions, which are there in the Buddha's first discourse, in the turning of the wheel of Dharma discourse. If you look at the conclusion of it, this is basically how the, con the text ends. It says that, and I'll quote the Buddha here, the end of his, the conclusion of his first discourse, or what's claimed to be his first discourse, he says, it was not until my knowledge and vision were entirely clear about the recognition, the performance, and the accomplishment of these four tasks, knowing dukkha, letting go of reactivity, seeing it stopping, and cultivating the path, I could, did not claim to have achieved a peerless awakening in this world. I take that as the foundational text of what I then develop as a return to a vision of the Dharma that is no longer talking about the ending of suffering. It's talking about the ending of reactivity. Mm. And that's important because that is what opens up the freedom to respond to the situations of life in a way that's not determined by greed, hatred, and delusion. That's nirvana. Nirvana is not the end of the path. Nirvana is the hinge. It's the turning point on which the path swings. And this is where I've got to. And, I've, and uh, I find this has been an extraordinary journey of discovery. People are not going to agree with me. Most, most Buddhists will probably think it's a load of rot. But on, as a personal practice, as a Buddhist thinker, this has been, for me, an absolutely central part of my whole life's work. Well, so then this hinge of non-reactivity, mm -hmm. what is that like experientially? How does one know one is being the hinge in any given moment and no longer lost or, or failing to cultivate the path? Well, I think the best definition I can, come, uh, I can find is, comes from John Keats, where he talks of it as negative capability. And that, in his words, is when a person is able to remain in uh, mysteries, uncertainties, and doubts without any irritable grasping after fact or reason. Uh, that, to me, is the nirvanic space. It's a space of Zen questioning, if you wish. It's a state of openness. It's a state of suspicion, in a way. But it's a state of responsiveness that seeks to respond appropriately to whatever the condition is that you are confronting in your life at that moment, be it an inner state of mind, being, be it the suffering of another person, be it a political decision you have to make. This is the space from which to live. And one, one cultivates that space by embracing dukkha, life, by letting go of these reactive patterns and learning to dwell more and more and more within this negative capability. And to me, that's what it feels like, if you want feeling. It's about a real sense of vital freedom. And I experience this, I think particularly I experience it when I'm writing, when I'm making art, particularly when I'm making art. It's, it's, it's a wonderful sense of uh, flow, mm. as Sense Mahali calls it, a sense of, of being totally focused, but fully alert and fully engaged at the same time. And then I judge, in a sense, my reactivity, or what is, in a sense, problematic, as whatever impedes, whatever somehow gets in the way, whatever blocks that, or, 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 or somehow you know, distracts me from it in some way. But that's, to me, the point, as you were also saying. It's about how do we live this moment to moment from a deeper and deeper ground of of, of awareness and, uh, and compassion, one would hope, but always in response to the situations that life confronts us with. Mm. I guess I'm not hearing in that framing an actual disavowal of the, the promised mechanics of transcending suffering one finds in, in a more 
traditional reading of the of the Four Noble Truths. So if you're actually in a non-reactive state of awareness, what is the, the relationship between that state of mind and psychological suffering or, or its mitigation? You see, I don't see suffering as, as something to be gotten rid of, at least not in a sort of momentary sense. I see suffering, uh, whether it's, a, my, as I say, a psychological distress that I may have or a worry or a problem in the family or whatever. My, mm. In the four task model, the, the first step is to say yes to that situation, to be completely open and transparent to that situation. Right. Which is a kind of, which is mindfulness, right? I mean, m mindfulness entails a willingness to actually feel the experience, right? Basically, that's what I think most people would understand as mindfulness. Uh, and yes, I think mindfulness is at the very core of this. And um, although I'm slightly digressing, but to me, the mindfulness movement is actually taking something from the very heart of the Dharma, because it's this capacity to be able to sort of stop and say yes to whatever is coming up. And that is the act of mindfulness. That is the choice to be aware rather than to just let events sweep you along. The next thing is to see how you're reacting to the situation and to notice, you know, all of your little inner voices and your fears and your anxieties and your neuroses and just, just being aware of that too. That's embraced as well. That's part of life. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just what's happening. So to include that within the sphere of mindfulness. And in that way, we free ourselves from the power of those reactive thoughts, patterns, habits, and so on, and allow ourselves to come to rest and repose in a non-reactive stance. And mindfulness at core is non-reactive awareness. And it's from there that we then seek to respond uh, to the world. So you, to me, it, the, tran the element of transcendence is crucial. But again, this is a word that's used, I think, sometimes rather too vaguely. What is it that we are transcending? To me, transcendence has to do with the transcendence of reactivity, the transcendence of our attachments and our fears and our desires. That's what is worthy of transcendence, in order that we are then able to act in a way that's not determined by those habits and patterns. Whether we or not we transcend suffering, that's really not to me a terribly interesting question. I think as long as we are embodied human beings, we will suffer. And uh, to me, that's part and parcel of, of being alive. And I don't really aspire to, to end that because I can't quite imagine that to me, that would be nihilistic. It would be about denying life itself in a way. To me, some of the, the deepest, the most rich and beautiful experiences of being human are in the midst of suffering, in the midst of, mm. of loss and death and so on. The, the, there's something very rich and deep in, 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 in the experience of suffer, suffer, suffering. I think Buddhists have demonized it and tried to get rid of it. And to me, that's getting rid of life. Uh, so I don't buy that anymore, I'm afraid. Well, I guess this uh -huh. is fascinating, Stephen. I, I just want to explore this spot a little bit more. So a lot of what you're saying resonates with me, but I guess I'm taking some of the same intuitions in, in a slightly different direction. See if I can capture what, what I think uh -huh. I don't agree about here. Well, so first of all, we can mean many things by the term suffering, and they're not all necessarily the same. I mean, it, clearly there's a the capacity for unpleasant experience, you know, unpleasant sensory experience, you know, mm -hmm. pain in the body. You know, that there's no reason to expect that to go away until we have a cure for pain. But many of us have noticed that it's possible, and I'm sure you've noticed that it's possible. In fact, I, I think I've even read your account of this in your Vipassana practice with Goenka, that it's possible to feel extremely unpleasant and intense physical sensation, and yet notice that there's a, you can break the connection between that and psychological suffering. Because much of the suffering attendant upon even strong physical sensation is in our resistance to feeling it, or thinking about it, our fear of how it will be in the next moment, our worries that it will never go away, or worries about what it might mean, you know, for you know our health. So, seeing the mechanics of all of that and letting go of the psychological component of it can al allow for a level of equanimity with physical sensation that 
few people imagine is possible. And there's also, it's, you know, in a, in a far more common way, it's possible just to reframe negative sensations and feel differently about them. And, you know, people experience strongly unpleasant sensations while, you know, working out intensely, say, but they, they know this is due to a workout and it's actually a sign of progress and it makes them happy. Whereas if they woke up in the middle of the night with these same sensations, they would think they'd, they were dying and they would call an ambulance. They'd be terrified. So the framing around intense sensation also spells the difference between suffering or its antithesis. But then there's kind of more obviously attainable ways to transcend suffering when you're looking just at the, the psychological component. So when you think of an experience of feeling embarrassed or anxious, really based on, you know, not a direct intrusion into your physical body, but just based on some thoughts you're, you're having about the past or the future, or just what you're reading into, you know, an expression on another person's face, say, and when mindfulness becomes strong enough to notice the dynamics of all of that, then there really is this capacity to cease to suffer in ordinary ways, or the, or the half-life, you can discover that the half-life of a negative emotion is, you know, moments rather than minutes or hours or days and weeks. And so that seems to be the, the traditional promise of breaking the spell of, of ordinary psychological suffering. Or do you not see it that way? I agree with absolutely everything you said. I thought you said it very well. But to me, that's reducing Buddhism to psychotherapy. And to me, it's actually diminishing the Dharma to look at it in that way, in that light, in, that, in the logic that you so clearly expressed it. And I think most Buddhists would see things that way. And I actually agree with it all. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced, I use meditation also as a way of, uh, of, of, of achieving exactly the things you talk about to diminish mental suffering. Right. Of course, a lot of, mental, a lot of mental suffering is unavoidable. And mindfulness techniques are very good ways of actually calming that down. But to me, that's just a, it's, 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 it's only a small element of the practice of the Dharma. Well, yeah, but I guess the, the traditional promise, however, is that, that this can become, I mean, so yes, it, so it's true at whatever stage of one's practice, you know, at, at kind of the ordinary stages of ordinary practice, there's the fact that you're talking about a, a fairly pedestrian level of mitigating one suffering you know it's it's available it helps it is kind of remedial and and therefore therapeutic and we have this whole mindfulness industry around that promise but the as you know the traditional promise is something more radical that you can be so established in this insight into the dynamics of of suffering and it's it's non necessity in each moment that you can be imperturbable in a, in a far deeper sense. I mean, there's, there's an image in, that I've always loved out of the Tibetan tradition. I forget which teaching or teacher this came from, but perhaps you know, but there's the metaphor of, you know, once practice has truly stabilized, thereafter thoughts are like thieves entering an empty house, right? There's just nothing left for them to steal. Thoughts are not the enemy. I mean, we learned this very early on. It's not about getting rid of thought, but for the longest time, we are, are in, in some ways at war with our capacity to, to be identified with each arising thought. Thoughts just come upon us and they, they go unrecognized and they seem to be us. And then, you know, mindfulness comes online and we notice them as, as a mere appearances in consciousness. And, you know, as, as mindfulness becomes deeper and ultimately non dual, we notice that there's actually, you know, that there is no thinker apart from the thoughts themselves arising in this prior condition. But you, you seem to either think that there's no hope of getting to that something like that final stage where thoughts are really are like thieves in an empty house, or getting to it would be in some sense still trivial or, or still not the whole story of what the Dharma promises. Oh, where do we go from here? Um... <laughs> You see, to me, the goal of the practice being the ending of suffering is to me not, I don't practice in order to stop suffering. Mm. Um, I practice to live fully. To me, the goal of the path is, the, is to live the Eightfold Path. 
And the, the, the empty house where the thieves can't get in is just another metaphor for nirvana. And it is. It's a very good name. It's a, be it's a beautiful image. Uh, but that is a space that is open and available to us in every moment. As again, Dzogchen and Zen and all these people will endlessly say. Yeah. You see, I find that reducing Buddhism to getting to some state of personal transcendence where you don't experience any mental grief or pain, frankly, I find that a very sort of self-centered goal for a human life. It evokes images of monks living up on the top of mountains and being in this blissful state, but what use is that? I don't find that a model for the kind of person I would seek or aspire to be. Except if I can just add one footnote to that, I completely agree with that possibility, except when you see how much suffering your own capacity for unhappiness creates in your, mm -hmm. in your intimate relationships, right? When, when, when you see what it's like to be married or to be a parent, and you see how you, you can't help but broadcast your stress and neurosis and narcissism and everything else onto those you ostensibly love, then discovering in yourself a capacity to cease to do that looks like a deeply ethical act. Mm. In fact, it becomes the only basis for a capacity to really be good company for the, the people you care about and, and to say nothing of strangers you might meet through the course of your day. No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, I've, I've gone, I, don't, I don't dispute this at all. I, I agree with you. But for me, this whole practice is really concerned with, if we look at the definition of the first noble truth, birth, sickness, aging, death, that's the issue that we are confronting. And the second noble truth, the cause of suffering is craving, to me is completely useless as a way of understanding birth, sickness, aging, and death. To me, the Dharma starts by embracing our existential condition. It starts by, as Socrates would have said, a sense of amazement that we're here mm. at all rather than not here. It starts with a confrontation of what it means to be human. Now, I, the, the next question is, how does the practice you just described, that, that I completely agree with, how does that fit into that existential project? To me, it fits into that existential project because it is at the heart of it, that that capacity to be less caught up in your fears and emotions and to be more mindful and present and detached and aware and sensitive, that's absolutely crucial. But that's not the goal of the path. The goal of the path is to be able to live from that space and to respond to the condition of your humanity in a way that's not driven by these reactive patterns, but is constantly moment to moment. As we're having this conversation now, we're seeking to speak to each other, to articulate you know, truly and sensitively what we're doing. That's the practice. That's the goal of the practice, is what we're saying. Whether or not you're coming from some non-reactive enlightened state of mind is to me kind of academic. And um, so, you know, my disagreements with uh, with, with going back to the earlier question, my disagreements with Buddhist beliefs is that they, they're, they're, they're stuck in ontology. They're stuck in attempts to somehow give an accurate description of how things are. I think the ontology has hijacked ethics. Mm. That if we think of the Four Noble Truths are ontological, they're framed in the language of truth. What is true as opposed to false? As, you, as soon as you start from that perspective, You've already entered that language game. I'm starting from the perspective, no, the, the starting point is, is, is my experience of suffering in this moment. How do I respond to that appropriately? And so the question of it being about mental suffering is not, it's not a question of it being about mental suffering, thinking that dukkha is just shorthand for the unnecessary mental suffering that we cause ourselves. That is true, but that I don't think captures at all the 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 weight the gravitas of the notion of dukkha dukkha is, the, is 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 the tragic dimension of life and my own life your life society's life the life of the planet of all beings is the confrontation with that and my worry about some of this emphasis on psychology this emphasis on sorting out your own mind 
is that it somehow loses touch with that grander vision mm. of, of becoming fully human, which has as much to do with how we speak and how we work and how we act as it does to how we get our minds in shape and order. Mm. So that's kind of where I'm yeah, well, I've got to in all Yeah, well, I, I actually, I certainly agree with most of that. I guess I, I'm still having trouble finding exactly the place to stand where I, I think we, where, where you're not standing and, and, and vice versa, because I, it, it sounds like it, you sense there's a, there's a disagreement here and I'm, I'm still struggling to, to find it. So like to t take, for instance, these two terms, one of which you've, you've sound like you have jettisoned. So Granted, I don't tend to think of craving as the the linchpin here, but I can see how it, it could be under a certain guise. So when you think about what it means to be non-reactive, when you think about what is the tendency of mind that takes you out of simply being open to the contents of consciousness in each moment, craving for experience to be a certain way, craving for it to change or to not change, you know, which is which is really synonymous with grasping at what's pleasant, or or seeking it, or you know, averting from what's unpleasant, or you know, seeking to cause it to disappear, and all of the uh, ratiocinations that come from the, the apparent imperative to play that game every moment of one's life. Mm. I think that is the craving that, if relinquished, returns you to being the, the hinge of which you spoke. Well, why isn't craving a good word to, to use in that sense? <sighs> because it's well, <laughs> these size, too bad. These sighs are, are priceless. There's, there was 40 years of, of Dharma politics contained Dharma in each one of those sighs. <laughs> um, the, you see, to me, craving just doesn't do the the heavy lifting. Mm. It's it's too it's too biased towards desire. Whereas even in traditional Buddhism, and I can put on my Buddhist academic hat now, craving is just as much hatred as it is desire. It's the craving to have what you want and the craving yeah. to get rid of what you don't yeah. like. Well, now, are we talking about the the Pali Tanha? And we're talking about you know thirst. Yeah. 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 Th I find it more useful to think in terms of what are called the three fires, which are greed, hatred, and moha, confusion. Yeah. And to me, uh, tangha is, is shorthand and more or less synonymous with the three fires. It's what rises up in reaction to experience. And the Buddha uses the image of fire, not poison. There are three poisons in later Buddhism. But initially, it was the three fires. They flare up. Reactivity flares up. Sometimes it's craving, desire, grasping. Sometimes it's fear, it's aversion, it's all those things. And sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, the reactivity that is the most pronounced is, is all our opinions and beliefs and uh, mm -hmm. biases and prejudices. That's reactivity. That's moha. That's the rising up of that kind of vocalized, conceptual reactivity. And... Um, the practice for me, what we seek to transcend, is not just craving. I think it's just too weak, that yeah. word. It's too narrow. What we're seeking to overcome is what I've started calling reactivity, which is a bit odd, perhaps, but I think it actually works quite well. And um, I was actually talking to Judson Brewer about this. Mm -hmm. He says that reactivity works well in some, of, in some of the research they've been doing on fMRI scans and things. Right. But you have to speak to right. him about that. But nonetheless, it's, the, it's this letting go of reactivity. It's this transcending, this reactive patterning that's constantly jumping up. And of course, the way you describe mindfulness is exactly how you deal with this stuff. But that's not the, that's not the goal of the path. The goal of the path is to live from that space mm -hmm. and to realize a way of life in the world. It, it's a constitutive element rather than the final thing. Buddhism has become infatuated with enlightenment and, uh, and, and sort of almost you know, highly uh, realized states of mind. And that's what it's about. And some of the things you've been saying seem to reinforce that a bit. Yeah. It's about getting to some sort of transcendent state. To me, that's taking an element and raising it up to the level of, of the final goal. Whereas I would see it as part of the structure that enables us to live radically differently in this world. 
it's the hinge of the path. It's this, this, this turning point, mm. this moment. I mean, every moment we have the freedom not to get caught up in our habitual opinions and reactive patterns, but to respond in a way that's not determined by them. It may not be, it may not make the situation better, might make it worse, but it at least is a response that's not just driven by compulsive habit. The other term I just wanted to... Uh query you on is how you're reading the term dukkha, which is often translated as suffering. And, and you did seem to anchor your reading of it to suffering, kind of capital S suffering, you know, the, the big suffering that is entailed by getting through this life from birth to death. That's right. But, mm. you know, that's, in my understanding, that has often given people what has seemed to be a false association with the Buddha's teaching that you know the Buddha is purported to have said life is suffering, as though this, the teaching was a a fairly depressing one. Whereas you know my reading of dukkha again, this is kind of conditioned by a lot of vipassana practice and the teaching one encounters in that context. But my reading of dukkha has always been that it's not it's not that the Buddha failed to acknowledge conventional forms of happiness. I mean, obviously, not all of life is suffering. Capital S. You could even point to a hierarchy of, of happiness, and I guess it was the um, is it the Mahamangala Sutta where he talks about kind of a mm. different stages of, of conventional happiness. I think that's yeah. So the um, it's not a denial of the ordinary human capacity to seek and attain happiness. It's just that the, the translation of dukkha that captures what he may have been more aiming for is unsatisfactoriness. There's, there's no impermanent experience that can be a durable basis for satisfaction because it, its very nature to arise proves that it will then disappear when conditions no longer allow for it. So it's just it's to put all your, your weight on this, this seeming imperative to seek and attain happiness is to not recognize the circumstance you're actually in, whereas you know, all experience is transitory. So nothing by definition can give you a final satisfaction and therefore at least points the way to the possibility that there is a a state of of acceptance and peace and you know, equipoise that isn't dependent upon the next thing that comes and goes right well you're you're no longer seeking to be made happy by experience you're recognizing something intrinsic to experience itself that is a a less vulnerable basis for equanimity. Yeah, I'm familiar with this way of looking at things, but um, I find unsatisfactoriness is probably the most unsatisfactory <laughs> of the different uh, terms we can use. You see, to me, uh, suffering to me is, is, a, is, is so, so, so central to what the Buddha is talking about. Mm. And to me, it has as much to do with the suffering of starving children in Africa as it does with the suffering of my own neuroses as a modern Western. Right. But the suffering of children in Africa to me is not unsatisfactory. No, no. I, well, there's no, no, a potential for confusion there. I'm not denying that there are extraordinary states of misery also on the menu. It's just that the, mm -hmm. the suffering reaches all the way from there down to even the, the, the subtle dissatisfaction of the highest pleasure is no longer enduring right so it's just not it's the unsatisfactoriness runs all the way through even to states of happiness whereas i mean th this connects to ideas in buddhism that you and i i think would either not endorse or at least we would be agnostic about which is you know the, the vision of karma and rebirth and all the rest which seems to make sense of this notion that there's there's a wheel of becoming to be escaped through the Eightfold Path, because there's so much suffering on offer, you know, if not in this life, in, in the next life, you really stand to be miserable, mm -hmm. you know, born into the body of an animal or a hungry ghost or something like that, right? I mean, that is part of the traditional Buddhist picture. I was once invited to give a talk in Delhi to an Indian audience in mm -hmm. the International House in Delhi. And I was asked to talk about Buddhism or some, yeah, I can't remember now. In any case, I remember then in that talk um, struggling to sort of articulate what I meant by dukkha. And I did use, in fact, the word unsatisfactory or the 
and I thought maybe it could be anguish or something. And I gave a, any number of, of, of ways of, of, of translating this term to this Indian audience. At the end of the talk, a number of the gentlemen in the audience said, but sir, you are talking about duk uh, in Hindi. Mm -hmm. Duk, this is pain. This is not unsatisfactory. This is not, this is not that. Duk is a word that is so deeply embedded in the Indian consciousness and culture. And whether we like it or not, dukkha is pain. And that is a, a part and parcel of life. Mm. And I've actually recently been translating dukkha simply as life. Embrace life. Embrace suffering. Embrace life. And um, in the sense, like in French, you say, c'est la vie. Mm. That's life we say. The, the, it, it, I, I'm concerned that, we, that Dukkha does not resign from its uh, role as the, somehow the, the, the embodiment of our tragic condition uh, as, as beings who, will, you know, who are born and who will die. Uh, and to me, that framework is extraordinarily important. And it makes Buddhism what it is to me. Of course, it has a wonderful practical psychology that has been now utilized in totally secular settings. I think that's fantastic. But I do think the Dharma has been somehow reduced to a kind of slightly technological way of thinking where you have suffering and then you have its cause and you get rid of the cause and you get rid of the suffering. That's true to a point. Of course it is. And uh, we can understand elements of Buddhism in that way. And we can understand meditation within that frame. I don't dispute that. But I think there's a much richer way of looking at it, where we're not preoccupied anymore with happiness and pain and misery and sorrow mm. and all this stuff. But we're concerned with creating conditions under which we can live more vitally and fully. And when you say, you know, we could never find, we can never reach some sort of final happiness. I'm not so sure about that. I, when I'm in fully involved in, an, you know, in, in, in my work, for example, I feel fully happy. That doesn't mean I don't have aches or pains or worries, but there's a sense of fulfillment that's quite enough. I'm not minimizing the, the state of happiness you might feel, but it's impermanent. I mean, it's by virtue of impermanence that it's unsatisfactory. I mean, you have to seek it again the next morning with a, yet a stronger cup of coffee. Impermanence is happy as well. I, I, impermanence it doesn't uh, it, it's not a problem. Uh, imp happiness is impermanent, and it comes and it goes, and that's its beauty, its transitoriness. This is you know you this is where poetry and art and literature uh, come into it so much for me. I think there's an aesthetic dimension to this practice uh, that that is able to embrace the tragic dimension. I'm less interested in happiness and suffering as I am in, in flourishing mm. and being and not flourishing. To me, that's much more important. There's a, pass, there's a sort of passive quality to these concepts of happiness and suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me just throw a few more pieces on the board just to, okay. so that we, we, we converge a little bit more. So yeah, I would, I would fully agree that flourishing or, or well-being is a deeper concept, probably just take it from the Greek, you know, the, the eudaimonic view of, the, of this is deeper than what can seem to be the, just the trivial mental pleasure of happiness or joy. And there's certain kinds of stress and effort and struggle that are intrinsic to what we mean by flourishing, right? We, do, we don't want passive lives. I mean, just over, overcoming obstacles and, and attempting something great and succeeding, all of that is part of what is more deeply enjoyable about being alive. So on some level, the, the struggle itself is a kind of grace. And yet, it's also true that moment to moment, it's possible to be neurotically entangled with and confused by the automaticity of one's thoughts. And it's possible to break that spell and to be, to be free in a deeper sense and more creative and more at peace. And that, you know, the Dharma practice suggests a way to to have more of the latter i mean i think i may be a little less romantic than you are about the tragedy of life or that you know i'm less enamored of what poets can bring to this but i've often said that i would recommend that people practice meditation even if it were bad for you 
right? I mean, so like the connect, the straightforward connection to health and de-stressing and improving the immune system, all of that. I mean, the, some some of that science may yet hold up. Much of it may wash out, but I view it much more like practicing Brazilian jiu-jitsu or some great martial art for which you know there are many many reasons to do it. There are so many benefits that come from it, but you can't in a straightforward way say, well, this is this is good for you physically, because it's the story is more complicated than that. You get injured, you know, there's it's complex and yet it can be immensely beneficial. Yes, I've often thought that if science did some one day conclude that meditation is bad for you, I'd still do it. There's something about these practices that are necessarily self-validating. Yeah. I do them not because they're good for me or because the Dalai Lama said they're good for me, but I do them because they are good for me. And I, I experience that uh, moment to moment. I've, um, to me, a daily meditation practice is very important. It, it's, it, it's a moment at which I ground myself, which I center myself, which I somehow tune in to where I'm at, not as an end in itself, but as a way in which to somehow prepare myself for everything I'll be doing for the rest of the day and the rest of my life. I, I'm a great, great advocate of meditation. I, I think it's the most extraordinary thing. But again, in the end, I don't use it for dealing, or I don't usually use it. In fact, actually recently in the last months, I've not been feeling very well, and I have started using meditation, therapeutically, mm. but basically just doing samadhi practices. I found that very, very helpful. But really, to me, meditation is only meaningful when it is an integral part of a a lived life, an examined life. Yeah. And that's where it really worked for me. That's why it's really important. That's the reason I, I do it. Uh, it's not just to feel good, but it's actually to somehow, it seems, and again, this sounds vague perhaps, it seems somehow to be a necessary ingredient for somehow integrating my life, mm. really. Bringing all the different elements into some kind of alignment. It opens up the capacity imagination, for example. I find meditation is wonderful for that. It enables me to see things from a new perspective sometimes. It sensitizes me to my environment more. It embeds me more in my, in my body, mm. in my breath. And I think it makes me more open and empathetic to others as well. But none of this, this, this only makes sense because my practice has always been one that's been uh, part and parcel of a philosophy, of an ethics, mm. contemplative discipline. And I can't really separate the different elements out. Well, I credit your many years of meditation practice with the fact that you didn't start shrieking at me at various moments in this conversation as I parroted back to you shibboleths of time gone by and Dharma instruction. And I'm now mindful of the time, Stephen, how long I've kept you. So, I, But I, it would be remiss of me not to ask you just what in the standard Buddhist teaching you disavow at this point as a one of the more skeptical voices, yet still Buddhist voices on the landscape? What is associated with Buddhism for which you have no interest or time at the moment? I'm thinking of things like karma and rebirth, the psychic powers that Buddhas or great meditation masters are, are imagined to have acquired. What, how do you view these claims? that are traditionally made? Frankly, I, I'm not interested in dogmas. What, what bugs me about Buddhists is that they have a dogmatic answer to most questions. They make claims to what is you know, absolute truth. Mm. To me, that is of completely no interest. It's, it's like they're speaking Martian. I just don't get that anymore. It, it, it's, so it's, there's no particular doctrine of Buddhism that I'm more in favor of or less than any other. I'm not interested in doctrines. I'm interested in ideas mm. and values and uh, ways of thinking that can help us live better. And if some Buddhist doctrines do that, then that's fine. I'm a pragmatist in that sense. I'm not interested in the truth value of doctrines. Does this doctrine correspond to a state of affairs in the world? Mm. I'm not interested. I don't know how you'd ever be able to demonstrate you know, reincarnation, for example. But what to me is a much more important question is, how does your belief in reincarnation help you live better? And I think for many people it does. And I've got no reason to dispute those beliefs simply because I have some metaphysical objection to uh, what the truth status of that belief might be. 
I would encourage them to believe in that way if it led them to a richer and fuller life that embodied the values that that person and I would probably share. It's a pragmatic test. It's, it's not, is it true, but does it work? Is it helpful? Does it yeah, get you to buy better? I, it seems to me you, you, can, you can only say that from outside the belief system itself because you can't expect people to adopt beliefs simply based on their utility. People, people adopt beliefs based on some sense of their truth value. If you thought you believed something simply because it, it was useful for you, that's not a statement of actually believing it. You, you believe it because you think you stand in some relationship to its being true such that if it weren't true, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, but I, nonetheless, uh, what matters to me is not whether, in, whether or yeah. not it is true. Right. Let's say the person believes it to be true. What matters to me is what difference it makes in that, per that person's life. Of course, you'll believe that stuff because you think it corresponds to a state of affairs in the world. I think this whole model of truth, which is, is, is this whole correspondence theory of truth is, to me, what gets in the way mm. of understanding what the book's doing. I think we have to jettison these notions, these simplistic notions of truth, and think of truth really as, if we want to use it that term at all, to think of it really as a virtue, to live truthfully, to be a true friend. There I think the word truth has resonance and meaning for me. Otherwise, if it has to do with correspondence of a statement to a state of affairs in the world, I can never, I can never test that, probably. There's probably limited evidence for it. And, I'm not, and I think it's a waste of time, frankly, to try to sort of justify these beliefs. But if a person does hold such a belief in all sincerity, in good faith, and it leads them to live a rich and fulfilling life that doesn't cause misery or suffering to themselves or others, makes them happier, then what's the, what's the problem? So I'm not, it, it, it's not a, I'm not, I just don't play this game anymore of, 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 of this being true or that being false. I'm not interested. Interesting. Well, hmm. through that door, there's a yet another two hour conversation for us to have, but um, I will leave it here for now. Listen, Stephen, it's been great to um, get your voice in this conversation. And I'm glad I brought up the Greeks. I didn't realize you had such a deep connection to um, skepticism and it was oh, yeah, great yeah. to get your, your take on that as well. Thank you, Sam. Uh, well, the book I um, will be coming out in February called The Art of Solitude does go quite deeply into skepticism through a life, a biography of Montaigne, mm -hmm. which is in there, as well as being based on a series of verses from the Atakavaga, the chapter of eights, which is, again, a you know, seminal early Buddhist skeptical text. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. It's been lovely to talk to you after however 